Uh, welcome to this uh, session of communication services at the conference. We are going to start with the presentation of the paper titled Performance Analysis of an Amplifier Forward Relay Assisted Communications in the Presence of Double Riley Fading and Shadowing. Good afternoon, uh, can you the hear The presenter, uh, please. Uh, Start now. You have to do your presentation, and then there will be five minutes of questions and answers. Uh, good afternoon. Can you see my presentation? <clears throat> uh, dear colleagues, do, can you see my presentation? Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. My name is uh, Alexey Gvozdarev and I present our research dedicated uh, to the relay assisted communication analysis uh, for the scheduled second order scattering fading. Your microphone is not uh, on. We, we couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, sorry. There's something. Can you hear me now, please? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Again, uh, the primary motivation for the current research was driven by the rapid development. Massive machine type communications uh, and especially vehicular communications, uh, which include vehicular to vehicular communications, uh, vehicle to pedestrian communications, and uh, in particular vehicular to infrastructure communications. Uh, in the, the last one includes the so called roadside units, uh, which are the elements of uh, intelligent uh, transport infrastructure. Uh, which are broadly assumed to be efficiently used uh, not only for uh, service information delivery, like uh, positioning, like signaling and uh, warning, but also for routing multimedia data from users to uh, communication operators, base stations or processing centers. Um, <clears throat> Moreover, the current, uh, currently the roadside units are equipped with uh, LTE and 5G models, uh, as well as Wi-Fi. Uh, thus, in such scenarios, uh, those roadside units can be efficiently used for uh, re uh, as relay nodes uh, and uh, most commonly as uh, amplifier and forward modes. Uh, the performance of a relay-based communication system generally relies on the propagation environment and especially on fading effects such as a slow and fast fading, uh, mainly due to signal and channel variations, uh, shadowing uh, due to traffic obstacles, uh, and as well as diffraction and multiple re reflections on uh, street corners um, and uh, pipeline channels uh, and intense traffic. Uh, one of the issues with the existing uh, publications uh, on this topic um, is that uh, they mostly assume uh, simplistic models for uh, vehicular uh, to uh, infrastructure channels, mostly Riley channels, Russian channels, or Nakagami channels, and uh, they do not capture the mentioned above effects. Uh, but those propagation effects can be officially uh, statistically described by the so-called uh, double Riley fading models, and uh, the most novel uh, among them is the, the second order scat uh, scattering fading model with a fluctuating line of sight, uh, which was initially proposed for radio frequency uh, communications, but was uh, also proven to be suitable for free space optical communications as well. Thus, uh, the proposed research uh, presents uh, the performance analysis of the relay-based system with the uh, fading channels uh, described with a shadowed double Riley fading model. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, within such a model, the received uh, signals envelope uh, is uh, assumed to be is assumed to be composed of uh, three distinct terms: the line of sight component um, with the constant amplitudes and uh, uniform phase, and uh, Riley and double Riley scattered components with um, constant amplitudes. It is also assumed that the line of sight component uh, undergoes uh, the uh, shadowing, uh, which is uh, gamma distributed with a uh, unit variance and intensity. A parameter which controls the shadowing, uh, which is denoted as M. Uh, 
such a model uh, can be mathematically described in terms of either physical parameters, uh, those are the components of amplitude, uh, uh, components amplitudes, uh, small omega zero, omega one, omega two, or alternative set of uh, parameters, relative parameters, uh, alpha and beta, uh, which define um, the Riley double Riley components factor. It is uh, alpha. Um, it is uh, the uh, double Riley component power relative to the total power and a line of sight component uh, factor. It is beta, um, which uh, defines the relative power of the line of sight component uh, relative to the total power. <clears throat> uh, such a model is suitable for both wireless, as it was said, for wireless uh, radio frequency and free space optical communications, and uh, it was observed that it can effectively capture such uh, uh, effects as double scattering, diffraction on the edges, uh, pipeline channels, uh, and uh, can efficiently approximate even free space optical communication models like IK model. Uh, and uh, the basic uh, statistical description of uh, such a model uh, was initially uh, proposed by uh, Professor Lopez Fernandez with his colleagues, uh, but the problem with this model is that it does not uh, admit a closed form representation of the probability density function, uh, neither for the envelope nor signal to noise ratio. Thus, uh, for the derivations um, become somewhat uh, intricate. <clears throat> Uh, in order to quantify the system performance, um, we'll assume outage probability as uh, the primary reliability metric, uh, which is defined as the probability uh, that uh, the instantaneous signal-to-noise ratio uh, falls below the predefined uh, threshold, and uh, average error rate uh, and uh, good capacity as uh, the link quality metrics. Due to the novelty uh, of the assumed channel model, uh, no closed form results for the error rate uh, or capacity exist uh, even for the single re uh, relay hole, uh, for example, from uh, the uh, source to the relay or from the relay to the destination point. Uh, moreover, no results for the uh, efficiently uh, uh, results for calculation cumulative distribution function, which is needed uh, for outage probability calculation, uh, exist. Um, uh, so within uh, the proposed uh, research, um, uh, since the uh, amplifier and forward uh, scheme was uh, assumed uh, as one of the most widely used, uh, the assumed metrics uh, were uh, rewritten in terms of uh, solemnly uh, cumulative distribution function, and it was uh, derived in a computationally efficient way, and uh, it was used further for deriving the closed form expression for the average error rate uh, average error rate. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, Thus, uh, the, although the average error rate is expressed in terms of bivariate and trivariate uh, Fox H functions, uh, there are efficient uh, computational routines that can help uh, efficiently calculate uh, uh, those probabilities. <clears throat> Thus, uh, for further analysis, uh, a numerical simulation was uh, deployed um, uh, and with a system of uh, multiple uh, quadrature amplitude modulation with the uh, size of constellation uh, from 4 uh, QAM to 64 QAM uh, and with uh, all the parameters, the channel parameters including fading severity, uh, double Riley and uh, line of sight components uh, were varied in uh, practically valuable ranges. <laughs> <clears throat> First, analyzing the reliability uh, outage uh, probability dependence uh, on the channel parameters was studied. Uh, here we see the outage probability uh, for different values of uh, shadowing parameter M in the channel between the relay and destination point. And as expected, uh, the increase of uh, the required uh, signal-to-noise ratio, uh, signal-to-noise ratio, uh, it keeps constant, uh, the system constant in outage region, although these effects uh, is most pronounced for small shadowing coefficients. Moreover, starting from uh, shadowing coefficient equal to three, the difference in reliability is quite negligible. Uh, thus, for more detailed analysis, uh, the um, 
study of uh, the influence of reallocating some power into double Riley component or line of sight component, uh, the, uh, those are variable uh, alphas and betas, uh, was performed. Here we see the outage probability as a function of shadowing coefficient for various power locations uh, in the second hop of the relay, and uh, the increase of uh, alpha uh, reallocates more power into the double Riley component, uh, where it is, uh, where, where is the increase, uh, uh, where, re where it uh, whereas its decrease improves line of sight component. Uh, in this case, um, the single Riley component was fixed, was uh, fixed on a constant level. Uh, point uh, two, it is it equals to twenty percent of the total power. Uh, and here we can observe uh, two main effects. First, uh, the outage probability is uh, sensitive to the shadowing, uh, mostly in the. Um, a high shadowing region, it is small m, uh, whereas in the moderate line of sight uh, and uh, moderate um, and light shadowing region, it exhibits some saturation. And uh, secondly, the impacts of a power location between the components, uh, double Riley component and line of sight component, uh, in those regions are the opposite. Uh, for intense shadowing, uh, it is better to allocate more power into the double Riley component, whereas uh, uh, for light shadowing, Shadowing the optimal strategy is uh, op uh, exactly the opposite. <clears throat> Uh, the dependence on uh, for uh, ergodic capacity, uh, it can be observed that the system exhibits a uh, universal penalty uh, compared to the non fading case, so which ranges from uh, 0.5 uh, bits per second, uh, per, uh, per second per hertz in low signal to noise ratio uh, regime, uh, irrespective of uh, shadowing, uh, and up to 1.5 uh, bits per second per hertz uh, for high signal to noise those ratios um, and uh, negligible shadowing. Here we have for shadowing equal to uh, shadowing intensity equal to 10. And uh, the dependence on shadowing intensity shows uh, the same effects as uh, in uh, outage probability. However, it can be seen that the increase of uh, uh, that in this case, uh, a very intense shadowing, those are small M's. Um, uh, the possible gain uh, from power location uh, is about uh, 0.8 uh, bits per second per hertz, while in case of low shadowing for uh, a higher M, um, it uh, twice as little. <clears throat> Finalizing uh, the system performance description with a rate analysis, uh, it should be pointed out that uh, there exists an irreducible error flaw, which means that the improvement of uh, signal to noise ratio uh, does not lead to quality ink improvement. Moreover, the error rate is sensitive to shadowing coefficient only uh, in the highest signal to noise ratio region, uh, starting around from 25 dB. Uh, and uh, quadrupling the constellation size, for example, from uh, 4 QAM to 16 QAM requires around 2 dB, uh, which is less than expected. That, thus, it makes uh, higher constellations application more efficient. And uh, zooming out uh, the area where the channel parameters have uh, um, any impact uh, on the error rate, uh, one can see that the optimal uh, uh, it is optimal to reallocate more power to the double Riley component, and this helps to reduce the average rate uh, by several times. Oh. Uh, Summarizing the above, uh, I conclude my presentation with uh, some closing general remarks uh, presented um, in the slides uh, and which were previously stated in the presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, especially I would like to emphasize that uh, the combination of the obtained results uh, uh, helps to identify the best strategy for adapting channel parameters, uh, uh, um, which is nowadays can be done by the so-called uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, um, which uh, makes them highly beneficial for the design of future smart uh, infrastructure and wireless communications. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? Somebody here in the room or somebody of the audience uh, the, at a distance? 
if somebody wants to ask something in Spanish and we can translate it as well. No, well, no, no question from the audience. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to clarify a bit. Uh, it, uh, this model is more uh, general, um, in general, more difficult than the simple models that uh, many times we use in, in telecommunications. And you have said that there are two possible applications. One of them is vehicle to anything, and the other one is in optical communications. Can you see any other application of this model, this low Riley fading model in shadowing? Or they are mainly these two applications? Uh, uh, no, uh, those two applications uh, do not limit the possible application of the model. Uh, mainly, this model is applicable where you have a distinct line of sight, which is uh, which can be possibly shadowed, it is the first uh, requirement. And second, uh, if you have uh, multiple reflections or multiple diffractions, uh, for example, diffraction on the corners. So it is usually like urban communication uh, within the cities. Uh, and here we assume like uh, streets um, where you definitely have uh, diffraction on the corners uh, while communicating between the vehicles or vehicles and uh, infrastructure. But this can be communication with uh, like drones or with the hubs or stuff like that. So the model is quite broad. Uh, the problem is it is quite complex in uh, description, analytical description. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, any thank other you. questions? Well, it seems there are no other questions. I thank you for your presentation. And thank then we'll much. carry on with the following. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Then we are going to continue with the second presentation of this session. This is a small session. We have only three presentations. Then we are going to carry on with the following presentation, which is FPGA emulation of the physical layer of an 802.11N base transceiver. Transceiver. Uh, could you please start with your presentation, please? Uh, your microphone is off. OK. Yeah. There? Yes, we can listen to you now. OK. Can you see the presentation? We can, yes, indeed. OK. Well, hello. My name is Fernando Aguirre Lopez Perez, and I'll be presenting the work titled FPGA Emulation of the Physical Layer of an 802.11n base transceiver. Uh, here we have the, the overall contents of for this presentation with a brief introduction to the 802.11 standard, the transceiver architecture that will be used for this project, and the BHDL emulations done for the project, as well as the conclusions for this work and a few references. Uh, the first of all, the 802.11 standard. It's a standard that was developed to help specify the configurations for both the physical layer and the media access control layer for uh, lo wireless local area networks. Uh, this 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 standard has been has had uh, quite a few of amendments, uh, such as the 802.11a, uh, 802.11b, and much more. But right now, the the one of interest for us is going to be the 802.11n. And mainly, we're going to focus on the physical layer. Uh, the physical layer for this uh, standard can be seen in figure one. Here, we can see that it can be divided into two sub-layers. And the first one is a physical layer convergence procedure, which basically provides the overall configuration for the data and the headers required for, to provide services to the MAC layer. And we also have the physical medium dependent layer, which is basically in charge of the actual data transmission and reception. Uh, in contrast to the previous amendments, the, the 802.11n standard introduced a multiple input and multiple output technology, uh, where it is possible to use more than one antenna in order to accommodate a larger number of users uh, without losing direct throughput. 
This technology can be implemented using the Alamounty scheme that is shown in figure one, in figure two, sorry. And here we can see a diagram of a two by two system in which the data is transmitted following the sequence shown in table one. Uh, first we send in, in a time t, uh, S0 in antenna zero, and then we send uh, in antenna one, S1. Uh, the following period, we're gonna be sending the negative conjugate of S1 in antenna zero and the conjugate of S0 in antenna one. And in order to do the decodification for this system, we, we're going to need three, a total of three blocks. We're going to need an, a channel estimator, a combiner, and a maximum likelihood detector, as can be seen in the figure. The overall architecture that is going to be used for this project is the following. The, we can see in figure three, we have a, a transmitter in the upper side and a receiver in the lower side. Uh, first, the data in a digital format is going to enter the, the transmitter. Then we're going to be applying a convolutional encoder, followed by an interleaver block, which can be, which will help us rearrange the information so we can avoid errors during transmission. Then we're going to be implementing a, a QAM modulator, followed by the space-time encoding using the Alamounty scheme previously mentioned. And finally, we, we're going to be applying OP, OFDM using an IFFT operator. Then in the reception, we're gonna be receiving the data through the FFT operator in order to do the demultiplexing of the data, followed by the space-time decoding of the Alamount scheme. And then we're gonna be apply, applying a, a QAM demodulator followed by the eight-day interleaver in order to once again rearrange the information to its original sequence. And finally, uh, we're going to use a Peter bit decoder in order to revert the convolutional encoder that we apply in transmission. Uh, next, we're going to be seeing the emulations done for each of, of the blocks previously mentioned. Here we can see that uh, we have in figure four, uh, the signal name data in contains the message that we're going to be uh, sending. Uh, we can see that it's a bit string of, of data. And uh, the output of the convolutional encoder can be seen in the signal com data which uh, is going to contain a total of two bit streams as, as the architecture of the convolutional encoder is going to, to work. Then we're gonna be having the interleaver block. For this block, we need to store all of the bits that are coming from the convolutional encoder in a single vector in order to do the rearrangement of the data. Here we can see that we have a valid signal that is going to tell the block when uh, the data can be rearranged and the rearrangement of the data is shown in the signal interleaver data in an hexadecimal format. This data is then going to be, we're gonna be applying a modulator. Uh, in this case, we're gonna, we're gonna be using a 4QAM and we can see the signal D in where we have the, the data uh, divided in segments of four bits, which will then be, be modulated we're gonna be having the outputs I out and Q out. And we can see that we have four possible values for this data, which is going to be three, one. In this case, we are representing in hexadecimal form. So we have F and D, but they correspond to minus one and minus two. After doing the QAM modulation, we're gonna be applying the MIMO Alamonte scheme. And in this case, we're gonna be using the, four, the two components from the QAM. So we're gonna be receiving, we're gonna be having four, a total of four signals. We're gonna have the signal for the antenna zero and antenna one for each of the components, uh, which can be seen in the, in the figure. After that, we're gonna be applying the OFDM. And in this case, we're gonna need to, to translate the data into the IEEE 754 standard. Uh, and in order for the IP block that was used for this operation to work. And we can uh, use a valid signal in order to tell the block once again when the data is already translated so it can proceed with the, with, with the processing of the data. We can see that we roughly are gonna be having a 15 microseconds of, of processing time. And here we can see the, the output of the block. We, we have a, a transform length of 16 corresponding to the data that we're going to be input. And in the value section of the, of the signals, we can see that the, the format 
for these values is in the IEEE 754 standard. Next, we're going to be entering to the receiver where we've, we're going to be applying the, 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 the modulation of the OFDM using the FFT operation. Once again, we're going to be using some valid signals to tell the system when the data is ready to be processed. And after that processing time, we can see here uh, the process of the data conditioning and the scaling that we had to do in order to revert the IEEE standard and uh, also the scaled information. As we can see in the, in the upper, upper part of the figure, we have the data in the format of 48, 16, minus 48, zero. And that is because the FFT operation introduced a scaling of 16. So we're gonna be dividing all of the data by, by 16 in order to recuperate our original uh, data, which can be seen in the lower part of the, fi of the figure. After that, we're going to be applying the Yalamounty decoding. As we mentioned previously, we're, we needed three blocks, which were the channel estimator, a combinator stage, and a maximum likelihood detector. The channel estimator in this case can be omitted because we're not going to be using a channel uh, for this test. We're just going to be using uh, in, in a directly connected the transmitter to the receiver. And we're going to be starting then with a combinator stage. Here we have the four original uh, data that came out from the FFT operation. And we're gonna be applying a algorithm in order to combine the data, uh, getting the results of the signals in the lower part of the figure. We then later are gonna be implementing the maximum likelihood detector in order to recuperate the data, uh, resulting in the two components that were originally introduced by the QAM modulation. After that, we're going to be applying the demodulation using a demultiplexer. And we can see once again the values of 3, minus 1, 1, and minus 3. And these values are going to be converted to, the, to a single uh, data stream, which is divided in, in sections of four bits. This, this data stream is then later going to be stored in a single vector in order to do the interleaving that we originally did in order to rearrange again the data into its original sequence. As can be seen in the signal X, we, uh, we, once we have the, all the data stored, we're going to be using a valid signal to tell the block when the processing can be done. And signal C is going to be the result of that the interleaving. Uh, finally, we're going to be having the beta bit decoder, where we're going to be inputting the signals into the IP. And we're going to be re uh, receiving the, the decodified signals. And here we have a comparison between the Peter B decoder output, which is the figure in the upper upper corner, upper upper side, and we have the original data that was transmitted into the system uh, in the lower part. And by comparing both big bit streams, we can see that they're very similar. But uh, we also did some image testing, and here we took the image on the left and reconstruct, deconstructed it using MATLAB in order to only get the, the bit information of the image. Uh, then we manually inserted the information into the system. And using the results of, of that were shown from the system, we can reconstruct the image. And the result of that, what, that was figured on the right. And we can see that in the beginning part of every single uh, sequence, we had a few errors. And by going back into all the blocks and seeing the signals, we, we found out that the bitter bit coder was the reason that those errors were presenting itself. So uh, some, some configurations can be done to that block in order to eliminate those errors. Finally, we have the, some uh, resource utilization and the max frequency for this, for this project. We can see that we had 7.6% 7 of the lookup table queues. 5.75% of the registers, 16% of the inputs and outputs, as well as 4.93% of the RAM and 4.32% of the DSP blocks. And the max frequency for this system was 32.18 megahertz. And it was obtained from a critical path time of 31.06 nanoseconds. Uh, finally, in order to finish my presentation, I'm gonna be presenting some of the conclusions for this work, from this work. And the first is going to be that uh, for the first set of tests that were done with a random data 
uh, vector, we got uh, errors for one bit, which resulting in a 1.9 BR. But with the test done with the image, we can see that we had uh, eight bits of error in every single one of the rows that from that image, resulting in a 15.3% of BER. And the another conclusion was that the, the error was implemented by the bitter bit decoder. And one way we can omit this error was is going to be to change the architecture of the bitter bit decoder in order to have a feedback between the inputs and the BER of the block. And that is one possible way we can eliminate these errors. And another one is going to be used to do some compensation on the decoding of the of the signals in order to eliminate those errors after the decoding. And finally, uh, for this simulation that was shown, we can see that we had a 20, 24%, uh, 24 microseconds of, of processing for each of the stage for a total of 52 data points, resulting in 2.17 megabits uh, data rate. But it can potentially be uh, increased uh, by changing the architecture of the FFT and the IFFT operations in order for it to allow pipeline uh, processing and instead of using valid signals. And that way we can have a higher data throughput. And here we have some of the references for this work. And I believe that will be all for me. Thank you for listening. OK, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Any of the virtual assistants or here in the room? I, I think that if somebody wants to uh, ask a question in Spanish, I think the presenter can translate it for everybody and answer it. Is there any question in Spanish? No? But I have uh, just a few questions. Uh, yeah. Are you using any channel model or where the errors come from? Where does the error come from? They came from the architecture that was used for the bitter bit decoder. Uh, due to a little bit of time constraints, we, we couldn't actually implement the feedback from the BER that was calculated in the decoder. So there were a few errors coming from that specific block. Uh, that's why in, in future works, we could potentially change the architecture or we can do some compensation for those errors. Okay, but well, you you are using you are not using any channel any any model for a channel, so it's a, a yeah, back to back right. implementation. Yeah, yeah. Right now we're not gonna we're not using any channels, but again for future work it could potentially be done in order to have a more uh, rigorous test for the system. Okay, and, and the other question is. Uh, what is novel in this implementation that you are doing compared with what this is existing in the literature? Well, mainly that uh, it was it was simulated in F in FPGA in order to prove that it can be it can be uh, implemented in an FPGA to for to further uh, support the development of SDR uh, architectures, and that way we can foment the the evolution of these technologies. Okay. Well, uh, I ask again any questions from the audience? No? Well, if there is no more questions, we thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Then we'll carry on with the third and last presentation of this session. Uh, the work is uh, titled Graphical Interface for Obtaining Yatunov Exponents in Fractional Order Chaotic Systems. Uh, you, you can start your presentation, please. Okay, hello. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see and we can hear well. Okay, thank you. Well, hello, everyone. I am Ulises Almada, a master's degree student at CITEDI. And today I will be presenting our work titled Graphical Interface for Obtaining Lyapunov Exponent in Fractional Order Chaotic Systems. 
Here's an overview of the content I will cover. First, introduction, theoretical framework, development of the GUI, results, conclusions, and finally, the references. Let's begin with the introduction. And currently, fractional order chaotic system are used in various fields, including telecommunications. For instance, Vincent Adayami utilized the random behavior of a fractional order chaotic system as a key to encrypt and decrypt images. As you can see here in the figure one, they encrypt and decrypt a, a RGB and grayscale image with a fractional order chaotic system, obtaining a completely random results uh, with the encrypted image. However, a significant challenge with fractional order chaotic system is that a numerical method used for integer order chaotic system cannot be applied to solve them. Then you have to use another methods which require more complex computations. Also, the numerical methods are not well uh, defined in some investigations. And to address this, uh, our work presents the development of a graphical user interface, GUI, in MATLAB capable of solving fractional order chaotic system from three to five dimensions. Uh, now let's move to the theoretical framework, uh, starting with the chaotic oscillator. Well, a chaotic system exhibits the following characteristics, nonlinear and deterministic. And this means that uh, even when a chaotic system apparently has a random behavior on the time, if you know all the parameters of the system and the equations, you can predict the results. Also, this system presents high sensitive to initial conditions, which it means a little change in the beginning can produce big changes in a long term. On the figure two, we can see an example of a chaotic oscillator. On this graph, uh, the system follows the figure of an infinite, but with a little noise, given the form of a butterfly. And this noise is the chaos in the system. Let's talk about uh, fractional calculus. At the bachelor, uh, we typically learn to calculate a first derivative, a second derivative, etc. However, the fractional calculus study the possibility of calculate a 0 0.5 derivative or 0 0.3 derivative, which it means work with real order or fractional order. As mentioned before, fractional calculus needs its own numerical methods. For this work, we select the Adam Bashor Molton or ABM. For time, I won't explain the method, but the equations one and two represent the numerical method, and the equation three and four are two functions which represent a variable of the equation one and two. Additionally, it's important to mention the gamma function which is a main key term to solve a fractional system. Finally, why we choose these methods? Well, if we see in the literature, we found that uh, this method presents low error, uh, approximately h squared, where h is the sample time. Uh, it means if we have h equals to one milliseconds, the error will be approximately 0.1% of h. And as I mentioned it before, these systems presents high sensitive, and for this, it is important to have a low error. Uh, let me talk about uh, Lyapunov exponent. These are like a tool to measure if the system possesses chaos. If there are at least one positive Lyapunov exponent, then the system is divergent and could be chaotic oscillator. Additionally, the system will has one Lyapunov exponent per dimension. Uh, what it means if we have a system with three dimensions, then we will have uh, three Lyapunov exponents. Finally, this is the bennett and wolf algorithm to calculate the Lyapunov exponent of fractional order chaotic systems. And this lambda is the symbol of Lyapunov exponent. And in broad strokes, uh, this algorithm uses a fractional numerical method in this case, the Adam Bash for Molton, to solve the system and uses the gram schmidt uh, orthogonalization method to determine, determine if 
the system is divergent or convergent, convergent. In other words, if the system presents chaos or not. Now, I will present results for two fractional Lorentz chaotic systems. First, uh, the well-known uh, Lorentz systems, which is the first chaotic system designed, and the chain system, an oscillator based on the Lorentz system. Uh, these are the equation of the systems and the behavior of each one. As you can see, the behavior is almost the same. Okay. Let's move to the development of the GUI. On this work, we design a main menu where, as you can see, we can select the oscillator and define the values of different parameters of the systems. Also, we can select four different buttons, uh, calculate Lyapunov exponent, graph oscillator, bifurcation of Lyapunov exponent, and equilibrium points. Well, the first button, uh, open a submenu, call it calcul calculate Lyapunov exponent, where you have to define a value of h to calculate the Lyapunov exponent. And when we press this button, uh, the GUI plot a graph with the uh, Lyapunov exponent. The second submenu is uh, graph fractional chaotic oscillator. On this menu, the GUI solve and plot the system, and we can select how we want to see the results if a long time or in phase in a 2D or 3D plot, and we can select uh, the axis of the graph. Uh, well, the third menu is the bifurcation of Lyapunov exponent. Let me explain what is the bifurcation. On this case, we have to select a variable of the system and define a range of values and calculate the Lyapunov exponent along those values. And the plot generated by those results is called a bifurcation diagram of Lyapunov exponent. Then in this submenu, we can select a range of the parameter, uh, the number of samples in the range, and the age to calculate the Lyapunov exponent. And we can see the bifurcation graph. Uh, finally, the equilibrium points uh, of a chaotic oscillator are the central reference point around which the system's trajectory orbits, but they are typically unstable or with noise or chaos. Well, the last two menu uh, calculates and plot the values of the equilibrium points of the system. Well, let's move to the results. First, we have results with two cases in the Lorentz systems. On the left side, uh, we have the results with fractional order equals to 0 0.985. And on the other side, with fractional, fractional order equals to 0 0.985 for the first equation, 0 0.99 to the second equations, and 0 0.995 to the third equation. As you can see, the results have some difference in the behavior, but in essence, is the same trajectory. Now, if we pass to the Lyapunov exponent, we can see almost the same results, but in the, in the case with different fractional order, in this case, the positive Lyapunov exponent is a little higher than the case with the same fractional order, then it's a little more divergent or a little more, more chaotic. But this difference is more appreciated in the bifurcation graph, where we can see the values of the parameter p between 80 to 150. In the case with different fractional order, one Lyapunov exponent, this the blue one, uh, is always higher than zero. By other hand, in the case with the same fractional order, there are some values of P without positive Lyapunov exponent, like 95, well, like with P equals to 95 or P equals to 115. Then the case with different fractional order is more divergent or chaotic than the other. Finally, in both cases, we obtain the same equilibrium points, and these are the, the values. And 
are the same because the equations are exactly the same. So the fraction order don't change the equilibrium points. And well, let's pass to the results with the chain systems. Also, we can see almost the same behavior in the case with the same fractional order and with different fractional order. But to plot the bifurcation diagram, we select a range between 25 to 32 for the variable C. And as we can see, in the case with the same fractional order, the Lyapunov and the A. The system possess a fraction, a positive Lyapunov exponent between 25 to 29.5 approximately. Meanwhile, the case with different fraction order, order, the system possess a positive Lyapunov exponent in all the values between 25 to 32. Then, like with the Lorentz systems, the case with different fractional order is more divergent or chaotic than the other case. In summary, a GUI was designed in MATLAB to solve fractional order chaotic systems, analyzing two cases with the same and different order. And in conclusion, comparing the bifurcation diagram of Lorentz systems, the case with same fractional order has 5% fewer positive life of exponent compared with the case with different fractional order. Also comparing the bifurcation diagram of chain system, the case with the same fractional order has 46% fewer positive Lyapunov of exponent compared with the case with different fractional order. In both cases, a change in the fractional order reduce or increase the chaos in the system. Also, uh, as a future work, we plan to modify this UI to can manually write the uh, equations for any fractional order chaotic oscillator, because for the moment, we need to add to the GUI a MATLAB document with the equations of a different oscillator to, to make proofs with, the, with that system. By other hand, we can add a new submenu to simulate the encryption and decryption of images with the chaotic oscillator. And finally, we can implement these oscillators in, uh, in, uh, in F FPGA on, with BHDL. And well, these are my reference. And it's all for me. Thank you for your attentions. If you have any questions, you can ask me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the presentation. If there are any questions among the audience, the local or distant audience, if they want to ask. Well, uh, I just have one one question. Uh, mm -hmm. What use do you foresee for your development? Are you planning to use it yourself only as a research tool, or are you planning to to share it so that uh, other users can use your development? Okay, uh, for the moment, uh, I designed this tool for for me uh, because it's a tools uh, to work with uh, with this oscillator but uh uh the plan is uh give this tool to the community if you need it uh -huh. it's not just for me uh, i designed this because i need it but if there are some researchers who wants to work with uh fractional order chaotic systems i can uh give my my interface because that's the idea to use the uh, fractional order chaotic systems in more uh, investigations because there are just a little bit of with this theory because it's a little complex <laughs> okay okay a any more questions from the audience 
If not, I want to thank you for your participation. And this is the end of the session. And I also want to thank the audience for their presence. Thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you. When we finish with this presentation, the session of communications. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>